Ken. Proposed by Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party. This is our comeback, ourcomeback.gov.au. Very forgettable kind of slogan. Maybe it will stick more in future, but for now, it's. Uh, I had to like Google four or five different things. I ended up going through like the Twitter accounts of some politicians to try find it. Eventually, it was pinned to Scott Morrison's Twitter account. That's the only way I was able to find it. I kept searching like recovery plan, recovery recovery plan, Oz government, just nothing was coming up. So uh, we'll see <laughs> what happens with that. Like, let's just demonstrate here, uh, Oz gov recovery plan, right? You would think that would take you straight to it. Recovery plans, environment.gov, budget.gov. I suppose this probably is it, the economic recovery plan for Australia, probably. You know, like it's just... But none of them were this outcomeback.gov.au, which I knew was the one I was looking for. So anyway, uh, I want to go through some of the things that the Liberal Party are talking about, what they have in store for us in the future. So let's get cracking. Um, <laughs> straight away, one of the first things I noticed, I did have a very quick look at this before I went live. So they've got these different sections here. Individuals and households, business and employers, find out more. If I go to a plan for everyone... This is it. <laughs> this is the plan for everyone. We're just coming back, baby. That's it. That's it. This is Australia. We will come back. And look, they're telling us they have a plan. That's the main thing. I'm glad they have a plan. I'm very glad they have a plan. But the plan seems like pretty much the same as always. More jobs. Bring back employment and businesses. More money in the pockets of everyday Australians. Like there's no... um. There's no real groundbreaking reforms here that are really going to like take the country in a, in a different direction where it was at. Uh, something I have seen recently, maybe I'll very quickly, uh, very quickly play a segment of the video here. If I can find it, maybe not. Uh, I think it was like a press club. Okay, what about on Twitter? I think he's pinned it, pinned it to his thing. Here we go. This is the one. So Jim Chalmers, who's the shadow treasurer, I think, he recently made a speech to the press club basically detailing what he thinks the future of Australia should look like. Um, the long and the short of it is that already pre-COVID, Australia was having lots of problems with stagnant growth, uh, stagnant productivity, wages, absolutely flatlining. And so his case is like, why are we trying to return to a pre-COVID Australia? We really need to be moving on to the next chapter. But I'll just play a little segment of in that now. In terms of lifestyle, in terms of the cities. It's up to us, Sabra. Um, and if there's a kind of a meta point here, it's to recognise that we know where we've been, we know what we liked and didn't like, we know what we're going through, we don't know what the future looks like, and it's for us to decide. Uh, anyway, you get the point. Thanks for that, like, 480p little uh, video there, ABC. So anyway, yeah, all sounding a bit sammy, but let's crack on through. So we've got individuals and households. Lower taxes, uh, training, infrastructure projects, first home buyers, and support for pensioners, right? So I think most of these measures were already announced in the budget for this year. I don't think that there's anything from like previous budgets to speak of in the individuals and households. For businesses and employers, same thing more training, investment, job maker hiring credit, and tax refunds, right? Oh, what have I clicked on here? Wait, did that really just send me to Google? Wait, what? How the hell did that happen? <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, cool. So here we've got the more in-depth kind of, more in-depth uh, points, I guess, that the government's making. I'm not going to go through all of them. I had a very quick look at like some of these ones here. They're condensed into the same thing. So like they've got their whole budget paper here and it just 
jumps to like the individual sections. So that's pretty good. But like digital business plan. So again, if we're talking about, if what we're talking about is the economic recovery plan, this is the comeback. And then I look at their digital business plan, which like you would think would feature massively, right? And then I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, 4.5 billion of investment for the MBN. My understanding is that's to bring fiber to the home, which was like the initial plan in like 2011. They're going to fund $30 million to accelerate the rollout of 5G. Like, I, does 5G need a faster rollout? I don't understand. I don't understand if that needs government funding or not. I feel like $30 million isn't like that much money to, you know, increase the rollout of 5G. Like if we just really quickly look, how much does a 5G tower cost? Here we go. Quora, see if we can get a... Okay. So let's assume, let's assume it's 20,000. Now let's lowball it. We'll say it's a, let's, let's say it's a hundred thousand. That's a hundred thousand US, keep in mind as well. So let's maybe get 150,000, right? Uh, let's do it the other way around. So 30 mil divided by 150,000 should tell us we're going to get 200 towers. 200 5G towers. Now, if we take a quick look here, I don't know any of this stuff, so I'm really winging it here. For, uh, how many 4G towers are in Australia? There's 6,414. So yeah, look. Oh, and that's just Telstra? That's just Optus, is it? I, I don't know. The point is, is like 200 is an absolute drop in the bucket. It's, it doesn't seem like that's a massive investment to like drive future growth and get Australia into like the cutting edge of digital technology, um, which I think is a mistake. I think there's a really good opportunity to do things like that. Let's focus as well. I, I've, I'm not really in a rush this morning, so I don't mind taking it a bit slower and kind of going through things a bit more individually. But if we look at that $4.5 billion for the MBN, <clears throat> uh, so they're all from the 23rd, 24th. <laughs> Why Australians deserve an apology for the MBN gold. Let's just look at the media release. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like we're just going to build fiber. 75% of fixed line premises give access to fiber, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Don't care about any of this. Like it's good. It's a good thing that they're finally building fiber for the MBN. But I feel like I want to like look later. Because I, I remember hearing somewhere that that very quickly got turned around, although it doesn't sound like it. Uh, backflip. It's a forward roll, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay. So look, more money for the MBN is a good thing. 30 million for 5G seems like nothing really. Uh, this stuff here, like again, if we're if we're talking about the comeback plan, like this is meant to be getting Australia back into a better position than what it was before, and we're talking about like, oh, we're going to let companies hold virtual AGMs and they can execute documents electronically. It's like, ugh. okay, I mean that's good. It's not a bad thing, but it's just like, where's the sex appeal in that? Where's the like something I, I something I want to do, and it feels like they were going for this, right? I want something to get behind. I want something where I can look at the government and go, actually, you know what? I can get behind this. I can get behind their their redevelopment plan because I want Australia to be in a better place than it was before COVID. I want to like get back to how things were. I want to improve on how things were. And they've really just given me nothing to, nothing to get behind, nothing that says like, 
yeah, this is this is what we can do for you. So anyway, uh, this consumer data rights stuff. So again, thirty million dollars, um, like drop in the bucket with digital business plan. And so far, we've got what uh, four point five billion. If we take out the MBN, which is probably money that should have already been spent, we're talking about less than a hundred million dollars being spent here. Anyway, let's let's get back to this consumer data right. So I looked into this. What is a consumer data right? I'd never heard of it before. It was a proper noun with like capital letters. So I looked it up. Consumer data right is basically like the government set up this thing through the ACCC where you can collect your banking data. So it's information on like your mortgages and loans and debit cards and credit cards. And you can share that data with another bank. Now, the point of that supposedly is to like try to get a better deal for yourself. So you can go take your information to another bank and say, look, here's how, you know, I've never missed the payment on my mortgage. I've paid off this person, blah, 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 blah. You guys should give me a really good deal because you can see what a good customer I am. Now, in principle, I freaking love that. I, I think that's great. But <laughs> it doesn't seem that outlandish to me that we end up in a situation a couple of years down the track where in order to shift banks, it's actually a requirement that you share your consumer data, right? And therefore, people who are trying to change banks because they may have gotten a raw deal, because they may be falling behind and they're trying to restructure their debt because they're trying to consolidate loans and so on, uh, they may actually get a worse deal than they may have otherwise. So in principle, really love the idea. I think anything that gives data to consumers is a great thing. But what I sense coming down the track, perhaps not so far down the track, is... Uh, sorry, just checking the stream stats there. <laughs> what I sense coming down the track is a situation where businesses, companies, uh, they were talking about rolling this out to the energy sector and the telecommunications sector as well, I think. So it doesn't seem outlandish to me that this information can be used to actually suppress people's access to loans, to cheaper energy rates, to better mobile plans, so on, so on, so on, so on. And we're going to provide $25 million to help small businesses use technology to improve their processes. This includes providing an additional 10,000 places for the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions, <laughs> or the more commonly and easily referred to as PASDIS program. Low cost, high quality advice on a range of digital solutions. Probably not like a terrible idea. Uh, again, not sure how far this goes. I'm not sure how far $25 million goes. Um, but hey, if it helps, it helps. I love how they just snuck this in here. We will fund pilots in the use of blockchain to reduce compliance costs. Now, I would be gobsmacked. I would be mind blown if a single person involved in the writing and creating of this budget was able to explain to me what blockchain is like that would blow my mind that would open doors that i didn't know existed if josh Friedenberg could tell me what a blockchain was gold uh they're also going to mandate e-invoicing now actually i'm shocked that we're waited until 2022 2022 to mandate e-invoicing I can't think of the last time I got a paper bill. I, I wouldn't even know. I don't know that I've ever received a paper bill. Maybe like maybe like 10 years ago, I was getting the odd paper bill that you had to elect to receive. So the idea that the government, the federal government, can't even do it in the next two years, that's nuts to me. But hey, let's do it. Let's get that done. Let's just do that. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, we've got close to a billion dollars here to modernize business registers and expand the digital identity initiative. Let's have a look at that one. I guess the business register is to make it easier to find ABNs or something. I don't really know what that is. Oh, God. Here we go. Commonwealth Digital Identity Initiative. Blah, blah, blah. They want us to give like... Is this going to be some sort of like digital identity or something? Wait, this is Commonwealth like 
This is like Commonwealth, Commonwealth, not Commonwealth of Australia. This is Commonwealth, Great Britain and the former colonies. No, it is the Australian government. So why are you talking about like one billion people worldwide do not have access to an official form of identification and 50% of them live in Commonwealth countries. So they're just like interchangeably using Commonwealth to mean Australian. And anyway, that, uh, that <sighs> threw me off a little bit. Look, okay. I get all of this. Wh- what is this? Legal identity for all. Okay. Wait, it's Australian aid. So I wonder, they must be looking to do digital identity in Australia. They must be. I mean, I can use bank cards digitally. I can like, I can do pretty much everything except for like get my driver's license digital. I can get my Centrelink cards digitally. I can, yeah. So my guess, my assumption is that it's something to do with getting digital licenses or digital ID, something like that. It'll actually be interesting to see if that is successful. There was, um, it may have even been a referendum during the Bob Hawke era where he wanted to bring about a national ID card, which in theory would make it easier to like navigate uh, government services. And the Australian people actually didn't want that. They chose to stay with state-by-state licenses. So I'd be very interested to see if this digital identity stuff goes ahead, what actually happens with that, what that actually looks like. If they're just trying to digitize like state licenses, probably no one has a problem with that. If they're trying to create a national identity card of some sort, that might actually open the floodgates to a very different set of issues. Um, So keep an eye out for that one. And we're looking at RegTech commercialization initiative. I don't know. Make it easier for businesses to comply with regulations. Probably a good thing. Uh, self-managed enterprises to develop technology-driven solutions to improve policy and service delivery. Okay, like $11 million for that. Uh, I don't know. And we're going to give $10 million to support fintechs. What's that? Financial technology companies or something? Does that mean like those compete with traditional financial methods? So this would be stuff like Afterpay, this would be stuff like those quick loan apps. Uh, I think there's a few that are like online only banks, um, so on, so on. <clears throat> so that seems okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. This will complement the rollout of the CDR and ensure that Australia is fully leveraging the Australia UK fintech bridge. So they must be making it easier for these fintechs to get from Australia to the UK would be my guess, or probably vice versa, I would guess. Look, I'm not going to read all of this. Just tell me what the fuck. <laughs> uh, okay, so the fintech is worth £7 billion pounds in the UK. UK Australia fintech bridge built on the existing cooperation agreement between the financial blah, 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 yeah. Closer and stronger collaboration on fintech between governments. So it must be like bringing regulations into line, I guess, more more than they would be otherwise. So all like cool stuff, I guess. But again, it's not this. It's not the recovery plan, the comeback, the stuff we can get behind. I'm not I'm not seeing any of that in terms of like the digital in the digital space. Um, where did I start? I started on digital Australia. Okay. Let's go to, I'm actually surprised that they have a section on women. I'm very extending the page. All right. I'll come. Well, let's look at this one. So for those of you outside of my personal circles, very recently I did a research project for university based exclusively on paid parental leave in Australia, particularly as it pertains to men accessing it. Um, So I'm actually very interested to see how the government is planning on extending the paid parental leave scheme. Uh, So let's look at economic security for women more generally. Okay. The first women's economic security statement was in 2018. 
they're going to give 240 million to the second one. To the second women's economic security statement. Is that like a group? What is that? I get the sense when I Google this, it's going to come up with just budget announcements. Announcements. So we'll go back to 2018. Okay. Yeah, see, they trick you. They trick you. It's the same thing. I swear I didn't click on that. Okay, I did. <laughs> Here we go, 2018. Um, so it looks like it's not like a group or anything like that. It seems to me that it's some sort of like, this is what we're going to do for women, probably. I would be shocked if these three pillars had changed in the 2020 edition. Workforce participation, massive for women, uh, which flows straight into their earning potential through their career lifetime, which flows straight into economic independence. So those three pillars, I would be absolutely gobsmacked if they've changed since then. Let's look at the 2021. Uh, ignore you. Uh, okay. Five key priority areas. Repair and rebuild women's workforce participation and further close the gender pay gap. So this is in a post-COVID world, obviously. As we know, as I've said a few times now, my understanding is that women were vastly outrepresented or overrepresented in the number of job losses and hours lost due to COVID lockdowns. Greater choice and flexibility for manage for families to manage work and care. So it seems like they're pretty much the same thing. So we're going to get work workplace participation back up. One of the ways you do that is by giving women, but families more choices as to how they want to get involved with childcare and things like that. Support women as leaders and positive role models. Great. Respond to the diverse needs of women. I have no idea what that means. Let's have a think. It means giving women access. What it means is, what I think it means, is they're basically saying that because women have children like biologically they have a pregnancy that we need to respond to that i think that's what they're saying i'm not going to read the whole thing to find out i doubt i would be again shocked if it was actually included in there support women to be safe at work and home so actually this is a much more in-depth couple of points from the 2018 one so doing things like managing domestic violence right managing workplace uh, harassment and assaults, women as leaders, women as positive role models. These are actually really, really good things. Um, I don't know where this money goes to though. That's the thing. So they've made a statement, but I don't know where that goes. I wonder if we can look at that. I might write that down. Maybe in another stream, we'll try follow the money a little bit. Women's economic security statement. So let's try to follow the money on that on another day. Okay, so let's support women in the workforce. Range of programs for women. The $50 million Women at Work plan will expand their women's leadership and development program grants to address barriers to women's participation. I feel like they just said that through $50 million in funding for projects that would create opportunities for women. This is the longest sentence I've ever read. The 50 million women at work plan will expand the women's leadership and development program grants to address barriers to women's participation through $50 million in funding for projects that will create opportunities for women. <gasps> Help women retain it. <laughs> uh, retain employment to build career pathways, including in male dominated industries. Yeah. Is that a double space there as well? No, it's not. Okay. It will also establish a respected work. Who who did this? 
I want to know who's responsible for that. And I want him gone. Right? I never want to see that ever again. It's no longer 2003. I don't want to see the at symbol involved in government freaking legislation. All right. So this stuff's probably all good. Let's just assume that it is. We'll give the government the benefit of the doubt on this one. Again, $50 million. Um, how much will that change this stuff? I don't know. But what it will do is give individual women access to things that they would not have had access to before. Like the Respect at Work Council. Come on. That has got to be one of the most dog shit names I've... Oh, God. Ooh, I just cringe looking at that name. <sighs> okay. Australia was once at the forefront of tackling sexual harassment globally. Was it? Was it? Government is providing $36 million to expand the Boosting Female Founders Initiative to provide women entrepreneurs access to export me expert mentoring and business advice. This will support 282 startups and 4,300 mentoring engagements for female entrepreneurs. That's great. That's great. If we have 282 startups, right? So not only are we doing all of these five things for women, so women business owners, right? So you create a situation where women can start their own businesses. So you've increased workplace participation. You've given them a lot more choice and flexibility for how to manage work and care. You've supported them as leaders and positive role models. You've given them the agency to handle their own needs. And of course, they'll be safe at work. It's difficult to address the home thing, but again, financial independence plays a massive role in actually insurance women's, ensuring women's safety. So if you can do 282 startups, if they employ you know, a couple of people each, you've created a couple of thousand jobs, you've, saw, you know, you've contributed towards a culture where a lot of these things are getting fixed, sweet. Good, good shit. Okay, government is extending the paid parental leave scheme. So <clears throat> let's have a quick look at this. I don't remember the exact details of it, but my, my current understanding, uh, they may have already updated it. Yeah. So my, my predominant uh, <clears throat> focus on paid parental leave was from a male perspective, the perspective of men trying to engage with the paid parental leave scheme. Um, basically, unless you're the primary carer, which is a strange sort of distinction the government makes between people who do most of the care and I guess people who are secondary carers, they call them. Unless you're the primary carer, as a male, you basically have access to two weeks of paid leave. It's called the dad and partner pay scheme, which already has very strange connotations the first of which being that if you're the dad, therefore you take the secondary carer's leave. And if you are the mother, you take the primary carer's leave. So let's take a look. Extend the work test period. I don't know what that is. Providing access to paid parental leave where eligibility has been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, okay, cool. An additional 9,000 individuals will gain eligibility to pay parental leave and 3,500 to dad and partner pay. So it what that seems like, what that seems like is actually nothing's changing, but just that COVID-19 kind of stuffed up how you would determine if you're eligible to receive pay parental leave. So for example, uh, let's let's... I don't know this, but let's just assume. Let's assume you've been stood down or fired from work. Uh, you would not then have access to paid parental leave because you haven't been working. Um, I think there were certain caveats on there, like you have to be employed for so long and do this much, blah, 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 blah. So they've just made it easier to access those things. Doesn't sound like anything's actually changing. Sounds like it's a purely reaction, reactionary kind of move to deal with COVID-19 in the very short term. Doesn't sound like that much is changing. Uh, we're going to give... $25 million to reduce complexity and streamline the parents' next program. I, I don't even know what that is. 
um, you know, if it's gonna, if it's actually gonna assist twenty three and a half hundred thousand, what a strange way to say that two hundred thirty five thousand parents, like that's probably okay. Anyway, I'm gonna take a quick, just five minute break here, um, and I'll be back shortly. We'll go through the rest of it.
Okay, I'm back. Got a cup of tea, sorted, ready to roll. Okay, so we've gone through the Parents Next stuff, which don't know what that is. Sounds good. Increasing opportunities for women in STEM. Also a very good thing. As we all know, STEM jobs pay a bucket load of money. Women are very underrepresented in STEM. Some of the culture warriors, if we should call them that, will say that it's because, of course, naturally women do not want to go into STEM fields. They're too caring. They're much too caring to want to go into STEM. Bless their souls. Uh, I, however, am on the, of the opinion that women are conditioned to not want to go into STEM. Uh, part of that is due to the harassment that they will face if they try to enter these male-dominated fields and also because they're not encouraged enough to do so. So don't at me at that <laughs> on that one. Anyway, $25 million to get 500 women through the STEM industry cadetships or advanced apprenticeships. I don't really know what that is. Um, I don't know. It, I don't know if 25 million to get 500 through is a good return on investment or not. I think probably it has. It would have a lot of flow-on effects. Um, just by virtue of seeing women in positions in STEM companies, you're probably more likely as a woman to feel welcome and accepted in that position. You probably, yeah, like I said, more likely to feel welcomed in that position. Uh, the Women in STEM Entrepreneurship Wise Grants Program, 20 projects, blah, 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 do more cool stuff with women in STEM. Uh, make students or, uh, I guess, girls more readily ex access careers in STEM. Women in STEM Ambassador Initiative. I don't really know what that is either. All of this stuff sounds good. All of it sounds good. Um, actually, pretty much this whole women's section sounds pretty good. Now, that's not to say, of course, that like, okay, we've done it. We've solved sexism with, you know, $100 million. Obviously, more can be done on all of this stuff. Uh, obviously, obviously, in a post-COVID world, a lot of things will have to change to accommodate the fact that I think 60% of the workplace that lost their jobs was women. Uh, but look... It could be worse, right? I, I don't know what the right levels of funding for this sort of stuff are. I'm just glad they're doing something. Okay, on to the next section. Let's go with... Let's go with more money in your pocket. I'm going to love this one. I already know it. I already know it. Okay. Okay. Well, they, di they didn't even go with more money in your pocket. They've just gone with lower taxes. Bang. There it is. Okay. So let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about taxes. Decisions taken in this year's budget will provide over $50 billion in tax relief over the forward estimates. Blah, blah, blah. So estimated... Reducing the personal income tax burden and supporting business investment... So see how that's like two separate things there? See how that's not actually the same thing? So reducing personal income tax and supporting business investment will boost GDP by $6 billion this financial year, $19 billion in the next, and create 100,000 jobs by the end of the next financial year. So you would think, of course, that supporting business investment would create more jobs, but they're very like slippery with this. How, how much does reducing the personal income tax burden have to do with that? I really don't know. And they've deliberately made it difficult to find that out as well. Um, yeah, yeah. As firms undertake additional investment, say, so what's that got to do with reducing my individual tax burden? As families have more money in their pockets, they can spend this money, which drives consumption and demand. This supports business, which will expand their operations and hire more staff. As businesses expand to meet the increase in demand, this, this grows the economy, creating more jobs. So this is like, just for those that don't know, this is like if you were to write a little section of what is trickle-down econ economics, you would write this. Well, as consumers, as families have more money in their pockets, they're more likely to spend that money, therefore creating greater business investment opportunities, 
which will benefit the consumer, blah, blah, blah. It's just a self-perpetuating cycle. Isn't that great? Now, as we all know, of course, those big brain listeners to Mr. Prime Minister, big brains only in this chat, we all know that trickle-down economics probably doesn't function quite like that. Let's leave it there, shall we? So look, yeah, look, they've even got the virtuous cycle of the economy. Oh my God. It's not just the cycle of the economy. It's the virtuous cycle. Look, here's the self-perpetuating cycle I was talking about. Now, if only we were able to input something that would make that cycle even better. Well, bang, here it is. Individuals receive a tax cut. Bang. Look at that. Straight in. They have more money. They spend more money. They increase demand. Because there's more businesses, the government gets more tax. More tax means more workers, higher wages. No, it doesn't. So I'm I'm sure there's a name for this. There would have to be a name for this. Basically, the lower the unemployment rate, the lower the unemployment rate, the higher the wages, right? Because there's less people competing for each job which means that the business has to incentivize workers to want to take that job. Now, call me a conspiracy theorist. The Australian unemployment rate, I think, hovers between 4 and 6%. Great goal. <clears throat> yeah, like 5 to 6%. This is 2016, so it's around around that mark. So what that means is there's continually like five or 6% of the engaged active workforce who can't find work. And what that does is it actually lowers wages. It lowers wages. So businesses expanding, they can either hire more workers or they can increase wages. They cannot do both of those things. That's not how it works. Wages flow back to individuals which means they have more money. So, I mean, this this whole thing could be debunked in about like two minutes. So if this cycle works, right, just perpetuating, everyone's getting more money, spending more money, more jobs, more investment, more money, more jobs, more investment, then why have Australian wages been growing at like 0.1% for the last decade? Now, I say 0.1, of course, including CPI growth here. So look at this. All right. We'll start at like 2010. Bang. 4% wage growth. I don't know if this includes CPI or not. Let's just assume that it doesn't. I don't think it does. So CPI is like consumer price index. It's around like 2%, I think. Australian CPI. And it's basically... It's basically an indicator. Yeah, so that's changed from previous quarter. Have you just got the flat number? Uh, that's It's going to be weird because of COVID. Let's... Let's go 2019. Okay. Here we go. So CPI, yeah, around that 2% mark, 2.1, 1.9. Okay. So what that means is CPI is basically like an indicator of how much total stuff costs increase over the last year. So if a CPI is 2.1, for example, the cost of a a, a groceries trip costs 2.1% more than it did last year. So what you actually need in order for wage growth to be real is you need a wage growth higher than CPI. I'm Again, I'm assuming this doesn't include CPI. I haven't seen anything about it. Yeah, I haven't seen anything about it. So let's go back to 2010. So keep in mind, this is a recession. Well, it's a global financial crisis. Australia never actually hit a recession. 
4% growth, 4% growth, 4% growth, 4% growth, 4%, bang, down to 2.9. We've got, in general, pretty good wages through all of here. Very, very big dip here. Liberals take power here, right? Since the Liberal Party took power in Australia, WPI, wage price index, down, 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 slight, slight growth, bang. Now that, again, COVID, doesn't count. But let's just go back to like September quarter 2019 or June quarter 2019. So wages in that quarter went up by 2.3%. Great. Great. CPI at the same time was 2.1%. So wages actually went up by 0.2%. They made no change. They made no change at all. You find more money at the back of your couch than you actually received as a pay increase for that year. Anyway, where were we? So yeah, this thing, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do you think the Liberals have increased taxes since they took power in this around here? So do you think here, when wage growth was at 3.9%, the Liberals went, all right, we're going to increase taxes. Bang. Oh, fuck. Wage growth plummeted. What happened? Well, it's not because they raised taxes. It's because they've been giving tax cuts. What? But the self-perpetuating cycle, it doesn't work like that, guys. So what what we're basically being sold here is an absolute porky. We're literally being sold like Reagan-esque economic theory from the 70s. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. They haven't even given figures here. Like this is pretty pretty average. The, the main problem I have with these tax cuts, let's, let's go back to this screen. It makes me less angry. <laughs> the main problem I have with the Liberal government's proposed tax cuts is let, let's... There's a few. There's a few things. First off, the top end of town receives, of course, the vast majority of the lessening of the tax burden. In other words, people that earn more money are paying less tax proportionate to the amount of money they were paying before. Not even just in raw dollar sums as a proportion of their total tax burden. Secondly, tax cuts in theory are a great way to stimulate economic growth, right? In theory. And then you drill down and you look at what a $50,000 per annum worker is actually going to receive as a tax cut and you realize it's like equivalent to $20 a week or something like that. Now, of course, I'm never going to say no to that money. I'm never going to say no to that money. But how much economic growth will really be driven by a $20 a week pay rise? I don't know. I don't know. Finally, when we again look at like the proportion of tax cuts as a percentage of income. Let's let's see if we can get Australian. Let's see if we can get a nice little graph for it. Let's see if we can get a nice little graph. Tax relief to back hardworking Aussies and create more jobs. Thanks, PM. Let's see if we can get anything good here. Mm, Doesn't look like it. But look, basically, here's what we find when when you cut taxes. Here's what we find. We find that people that are on low incomes will spend that money straight away. That's good for consumption and creating growth and blah, 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 blah. Assuming, of course, they spend that money locally at local businesses and don't instead just spend that money on Amazon. Now, not the shit on Amazon here. It's not what I'm trying to do. But the point is, is that that money supports logistics jobs. And that's pretty much it. Like it supports a product being taken from a warehouse to your house, which is good. But if you purchase something from a shop, from a brick and mortar store, as an example, it supports all the same things. So it supports the dock workers who have to unload the thing, who put it on the back of the truck. The truck takes it to the warehouse. The warehouse distributes it to the stores So we're all the same so far, except then additionally, 
that product supports the person that owns that store. It supports the people that work at that store. It supports the neighboring coffee shops. It supports the neighboring cafes and places where they will eat their lunch. And it supports all the local businesses around it as well. So yeah, look, a tax cut will be spent by low income earners, but hopefully we're spending it in the right places. Now, if we flip that on its head and say, well, tax cuts for the wealthiest people, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that wealthy people spend their tax cuts. Do wealthy people spend their tax cuts? Now, of course, Dr. Google will tell me the answers, but like, yeah, straight away, most millionaires don't plan to spend their tax savings. Well, tax in, well income tax cuts actually simulate the Australian economy. This could be a good little smartcompany.com.au. Never heard of them. I have no no opinion whatsoever on the validity of this website. Blah, 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 blah. Now, having said all of this, having said all of this, dropping the tax rate, say, um, how much do I want to go into detail about this? How much knowledge can I assume my viewers have about tax brackets? Let's assume like a moderate understanding of it. So dropping the tax rate from $90,000 to $180,000 and just actually getting rid of that and putting a $37,000 income earner on the same tax bracket as $180,000, that's not the way we want this to go. That is not the way we want this to go. The top threshold of the 19% tax rate, raising that, great. Great, 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 great. Because these are low-income earners, right? So the less money that low-income earners have to spend on tax, the better. But having an 18,000, yeah, just just boggles the... But let's see what these guys have to say. At the margin, it depends on who the tax cuts go to. They find high income people spend less of a tax cut or lump sum payment. So it's just common sense, really, right? Like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth, of course, you're more likely to spend the extra $20 a week you receive. If you're already quite wealthy and you're already saving a significant portion of your income or you're purchasing shares or investment properties or blah, 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 you're very unlikely to need to spend that on goods and services that keep the economy churning, right? So yes to tax cuts in theory, in principle, are they a way to bring us back, make the comeback happen, make Australia better than it ever was before? No, unfortunately, is the answer. Unfortunately, no, it does not seem to me that tax cuts will be the driving force of Australian growth. Now, the last thing I'll say about tax cuts is about how they retroactively uh, dated the tax cuts from October when the legislation was introduced with the with the budget and they retroactively dated the tax cuts back to the quarter starting 1st of July. Now, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Because it doesn't help me now. It doesn't help me consume more now because I pay less tax over the last three months. No, what it means is come tax return time for the three months, July to October, my tax debt will actually be lower than it would have otherwise. And I'll receive more in my tax return July next year than I would have otherwise. How on earth does that help the Australian economy get kickstarted now? It makes no sense whatsoever. It it really feels like to me a blatant political ploy um, in the same sort of vein as what I've been talking about with the lower and middle income tax offset. I have no problem with any of these things, by the way, but let's just call them what they are. It's the Liberal Party trying to say, we make you pay less tax. We're decreasing your tax burden. Um, just look at your tax returns. Just look at your tax returns. And it feels like there's no actual like guiding principles or guiding reason why they're actually doing it outside of increasing their own political authority. Is that a bad thing? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm okay with that because at the end of the day, the taxpayer benefits, but uh, I'm not sure. I'd, ha I'd have to think about that one a little more. Anyway, I don't think I even made it through most of this. Business tax incentives, that gets a lot more complicated. That gets a lot more complicated uh, in terms of my 
assessing of their their how good they are. Um, yeah, business taxes gets a lot more difficult for me to assess. So rather than assess them, I'm going to give some some pro arguments and counter arguments. So I have heard the argument made that corporations should not pay tax whatsoever. Um, and on the face of it, that seems like a very antithetical or antithetical argument to how we actually want the country to manage, right? Like we want people and businesses to pay their fair share. Now, the counter argument to that, of course, is that, well, businesses by virtue of existing are generating such a tax pool already through employment, GST, uh, income, uh, not income, rather, importing, exporting. Like there's so many tax taxes that are already paying and we've already created a system where it's so easy, particularly for not multinationals, to not pay tax at all or to at the very least minimise their tax to such an extent they're effectively not paying tax, that rather than playing this cat and mouse game where we have to fund the ATO to chase multinationals who then up increase the amount of accountants they're hiring so that we have to fund the ATO more, blah, 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 blah. Let's just cut the whole thing and just say, companies, you don't pay tax anymore. I don't know where I sit exactly on that. I think that if I think about like small businesses someone that employs like less than 10 people, I think they currently pay like what, 20%? Something like that. 27.5%. So they pay 27.5% on every dollar of profit they make. So for every dollar of profit a small business makes, which is already tough, which is already tough, 30% of it, or 27 cents, 27 and a half cents goes straight to the government. Think about how much better a small business would be able to perform if their profit margin was suddenly overnight increased by 30%. That would be wild, wild. If we're talking about this, right, employing more people, getting more jobs, giving more wages, increase the amount of money that people have, spend that money, Business increase, blah, blah, blah. Think about how much a small business would benefit from a 30% tax cut. Now, again, I'm not making an argument one way or the other. I just think it's an interesting kind of thought experiment. Um, anything you can do to cut the tax burden on a small business is massive for the Australian economy. Fantastic for the Australian economy. We want people working at small businesses. And anything you can do that makes it easier... For a small business to hire someone, the better. Okay. Oh, they've got all their figures here. So, you know, two and a half, almost $3,000 for singles. But that that's including, yeah. So, again, they've kind of done this thing where they put two things together. So, we've brought forward tax cuts. And we're also giving you a one-off additional benefit from the lower middle income tax offset in 2021. So as a result, you're getting a two or three thousand dollar tax relief. Now let's ignore the fact that you know a thousand dollars of that is from this, which you're getting anyway. You're getting that anyway. So you're realistically getting like seventeen hundred dollars from your tax cut. Is that good? Yes. It's not a bad thing. Like I'll take it. Is it going to drive future growth in the economy? Probably not. It's probably going to service a bit of credit card debt maybe make some slightly higher than normal repayments on mortgages. Like, yeah, I don't think it's going to be like this drastic change in people's lives. Then we look at this. So like minus $160, $1,060. Okay. Great. As a proportion of tax, ginormous, 20% less tax. Bang. Get down to here. You're making 200 grand per year and all of a sudden the government's like, all right, you can pay $2,500 less per tax. Per, you know what I'm saying. Pay $2,500 less in tax than you did last year. Where does this money go? This money goes to school books, food, paying down credit cards, 
paying off interest on mortgages. Where's this money go? Where's that go? Because as we've seen here, the RBA finds that higher income people spend less of a tax cut. So where's that money go? That's my question. All right. Well, this has already been going on for an hour. So I'm going to cut here. I may come back later on and go through the rest of this. Thank you to those watching. Thank you to those who are watching later on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to change a couple of things with the YouTube channel. I think I might start doing like a raw dump of the stream. And then I might also do like a more edited kind of trimmed down version, more in the vein of like 10 minutes rather than an hour. But anyway, thank you again for watching. Peace, my dudes. Thank you and goodbye.